Sophie, aloha Friday. Welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. The sacred relationship between children, mothers, and families are universal. No matter where on earth we find ourselves at, special attention is paid to them. Some places are doing better than others with regards to inf infant mortality rates, public health policy, and legislative work, as well as direct services that empower and support families, children, and mothers to thrive. Other places have ways to go. Take the birth of a child, for example, and pay, paid family leave. Why is it so important that parents have a chance to spend time with their babies at home without having to worry about losing their job, income, and benefits? Some countries offer 52 or more weeks of paid family leave when a child is born. Others between 26 and 51 weeks, and some countries even 14 weeks. How many months of paid family leave do we have allocated in the United States? Zero. That means no paid family leave is available for families. Quite shocking, isn't it? Today, we have a very special guest with us, Lisa Kimura, Executive Director of Healthy Mothers and Healthy Babies Coalition of Hawaii. Let's find out about what type of services this marvelous coalition offer to our community and how they're working with other community partners to ensure that maternal, child, and family health continue to be improved in the state of Hawaii. And of course, let's find out how public education, advocacy, and public policy development, along with your support, are the perfect ingredients to make that happen. On that note, well, welcome to our program, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. What an honor. You know, what a special topic to talk about it. You know, it's the heart of our states and in, in the world, the family and children. Yes. Um, before we start, uh, I'd like to give our viewers a little uh, help to understand uh, you know a little bit about our guests and so do you mind telling us um, where do you come from and what your professional and educational background is sure sure so i've been with healthy mothers healthy babies for almost five years um, and in that capacity working on legislative advocacy program services and just basically helping to make sure all moms and babies are mm -hmm. supported before during and after pregnancy um, prior to this um, i was with aloha united way and um, working on again social services primarily uh, a lot on early childhood development, mm -hmm. um, but as well as uh, improving the whole social safety net that we have. And it's just as I have three children of my own, so having those children are really what profoundly changed my life and, and gave me the direction and the passion that I have for making sure that moms have babies that are welcomed and thriving and happy and, and have all the resources and support that they need. Mm -hmm. Was that part of becoming a mother that helped you make that leap professionally and say, I want to work to improve maternal child health in the state of Hawaii? A hundred percent, yeah. I, having had my first couple of children, um, you know, I was in the nonprofit sector and then for a while I was in the, the private sector and it was such a surprise to me about sometimes what the lack of availability of services are and the lack of supports that are available for new moms and knowing that those resources don't exist or aren't available to all moms or the fact that moms can just kind of fall through the cracks in terms of even making sure that the quality of care that they have is sufficient all of those things really impacted me and and helped me refine my focus and once i kind of got set on that path it was just i just consumed as much information as i possibly could to to work towards improving things for all parents mm, oh, that's wonderful so it really comes from the heart and that passion to make it better from personal experiences as well definitely so do you mind telling our viewers a little bit about uh, the vision and mission of Healthy Mothers and Healthy Baby Coalition of Hawaii Absolutely. and also when the coalition was formed. Yeah, this year is actually our 25th anniversary so it's exciting for us. Um, we got started and we've kind of changed throughout the years. Um, the, actually the national HMHB was founded in 1981 so 20 or 36 years ago uh, and it was started because of the Surgeon General's uh, warning on the need to reduce infant mortality in the United States um, and then locally such as our local co coalition were founded to work on the the problems and the issues that are unique to our state and you know our islands 
And so our coalition is based in Honolulu, but we serve all women, all families throughout all islands. Mm -hmm. um, we have programs on all islands that are designed, you know, primarily we want to reduce infant and maternal mortality rates, but we also just want to make sure that all families are getting access to health care, that the amount of services are sufficient for what they need, and we want to make sure that all pregnancies are intended, because about half of all pregnancies are not. So, um, of course, there's a, a lot of negative outcomes that come from pregnancies that are not intended, such as, you know, again, mortality rates are higher, mm -hmm. um, but also just worse um, outcomes, preterm births, low birth weight babies, um, babies that aren't getting sufficient nutrition during pregnancy. So in order to impact that, we want to make sure moms are getting access to reproductive health care, and that includes contraception, making it as readily available as possible. Mm -hmm. And the, the health screening as well. Exactly. So, um, a healthy mothers, healthy baby do help parents when they are pregnant. How does the uh, screening process and uh, uh, linking a mother with the services happen? So sometimes it's as simple as just making sure that all of the dots are connected within, you know, between Department of Health, Department of Human Services, birthing hospitals, other nonprofits, and making sure that, you know, especially high-risk, low-income moms, if they're finding that they're not getting the services that they need, that we're connecting them. And then when we find that those times, um, things that we can impact, such as screening women for substance abuse during pregnancy, it's a very very simple but very critical element that that can take place um, and when we uh, we've worked collaboratively with a lot of partners to help make sure that doctors have screening tools that are appropriate and that they're asking questions in the right way so moms don't feel threatened or victimized or worried or you know have the tendency to not want to be honest about what's really going on because there's help available but we just have to make it available to them in the right way so that being a very simple um, uh, way that we've approached the issues. It also goes so far as we're working on a statewide strategic breastfeeding plan right now, and we're working collaboratively between a lot of partners on all islands, make sure we get education to providers so that they know how to give good advice to moms that are struggling resources because they just don't have them and, and, and so on and so forth. So let's talk about one of uh, the universal you know, gifts of motherhood and breastfeeding. Uh, so I know that that's one program that you know is uh, big for our state and that you promote. So what are the benefits of breastfeeding a child versus providing formula? Mm -hmm. You know, when when a mom is not able to breastfeed for some reason, you know, formula is absolutely a life-saving substitute. However, um, when moms do have the ability to breastfeed, it is by far and away the most important thing they can do for the lifelong health of their child as well as their own health. Mm -hmm. um, so moms get benefits it's too. Reduced risk of ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and, and other things. For babies, though, it, it is the building block for their immune system. Mm -hmm. So everything from reduced risk of respiratory infection and colds, allergies, asthma, diabetes, even childhood leukemia rates are reduced um, by breastfeeding. SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, is another one that uh, children that are exclusively breastfed have about a 50% reduced risk of dying from SIDS. So the impact is huge, it's broad, um, and then that's not even talking about all the other little mm -hmm. things like bonding with your baby and having a really special uh, relationship with each other that's just, you know, that certainly babies can be healthy and thrive even without mm -hmm. a breastfeeding relationship, but it's just an amazing gift that you can give. Yeah, absolutely. So you do have a program that supports that with mothers, young mothers, first time mothers, or we do. Yeah. So we work, we work with the teen population um, because that, that tends to be statistically one of the populations that's least likely to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. um, we also know there's other, um, some ethnic groups and, and education levels and such play a big part into why moms choose to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's an education level and just not knowing how to get started or knowing how yes. to get help. Sometimes it's family support and, you know, having parents or grandparents that didn't grow up or didn't raise their children breastfeeding, and so it's, it seems foreign mm -hmm. and seems unfamiliar to them. Yeah, look um, at that. We just got exactly. our picture with the breast milk causing more of a, uh, good things for babies in need. So look at right. all of these amazing gifts. Yes, and all of these things are completely irreplaceable and absolutely unable to be reproduced in a lab. So, mm -hmm. of course, you can give babies the, the, the building basics. blocks to grow, but it's, it's a sterile, well, it's a substance. 
substance, it's not a living substance mm -hmm. um, like breast milk is. And mm -hmm. you know, when you're sick, your body produces antibodies that pass through the milk, so it protects the child from what illness you have. Um, it gives them immune protection that you just can't get from, uh, you know, from formula. And and again, it is. Imp important that babies have access to that if mom is not able to, but it is an absolutely unique substance just between mom and baby, and it continues to change from the time baby is brand new newborn to the time you wean, which a lot of people ask, when is a good time? The World Health Organization recommends up to age two or longer if preferred. Mm -hmm. So there's no expiration date, there's no cutoff, it's, it's really simply what's best for mom and baby. Right. Yeah. And uh, I think also in our country there's such a stigma, you know, attached to breastfeeding, but it's changing to more uh, workplaces are making it available that the woman can express the milk or yes. breastfeeding public. Yes. It doesn't yes. have such a, you know, controversial uh, ramifications right. and people right. not being arrested. Right. Well, you know, it's it's in our culture we've sexualized breasts so much that it's very difficult for people to sometimes separate that, especially if they're a new mom for the first time and it seems like a crazy thing they've never done before. Um, but you know, 49 out of 50 states, including ours, protect a woman's right to breastfeed anytime, anywhere. Um, and particularly in our state, you do not need to be covered up. A lot of moms mm -hmm. ask that question. It is not indecent exposure, and moms don't need to be worried about that. Any public place that you're allowed to be, you're also allowed to feed your baby. So you can't ask a mom to leave, you can't ask her to cover up, you can't ask her to go to her car, all of those things. And, and moms, it's important to know when they go back to work, that's one of the huge stumbling blocks for why they might stop breastfeeding. Using a pump might be inconvenient, they might be worried about getting break time, but all employers are required to give moms a time, time to pump as well as a place that's private, shielded from the view of their coworkers, and is not a bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't need to be an expensive build out. All it needs to be, it could be as simple as having a curtain that protects them from view of others, um, mm -hmm. and certainly an electric outlet as well for them. But it's, it's simpler than people think it might be. Exactly. Well, that's wonderful to hear that something so simple can yield to such a big impact and result for both mother and babies. So um, so that's one critical uh, service that you provide through Healthy Mothers and Healthy Babies. So there's another one that's a big one with SID. So um, we can talk a little bit about that and then kind of jump in and wrap it up with that topic at after our break. So what would you like to tell us about um, the program that you've yeah, absolutely. Statewide. Right. So um, one of the, well, the most common cause of accidental infant death is sleep-related deaths. And that could be suffocation. It could be SIDS, which is a very unexplained sort of mysterious disease where babies die for no apparent reason while they're sleeping. Um, it, and it could be asphyxiation, it could be a variety of things, it could be rolling over on them in bed, but for all of these factors combined, um, it is the most common cause of accidental death. And all those deaths are, 90% of them occur within the first six months of life, and they're largely preventable. Mm -hmm. um, so That's our good, program yeah. is based on a national program, program called Cribs for Kids. And what we do is we work with partners, multiple sites on all islands to get referrals um, they have to meet an income uh, threshold as well as be defined as high risk due to um, prenatal factors such as uh, substance use or history of domestic violence or other things that make them more likely to be susceptible mm -hmm. to, to um, mortality. Um, we take them to a one-hour class where they learn all of the protective factors. And there's surprising things. Again, like breastfeeding is a surprising protective factor because it doesn't seem to correlate to sleep, but it has a huge direct um, correlation. Um, and things also like smoking in the household, babies that are exposed to tobacco smoke in utero and, and as you know, out in the, in, um, in the environment, mm -hmm. have a also hugely more uh, increased risk of, of death. And, mm -hmm. and so teaching parents these things that they can do to protect their child, making sure that they have their own secure place to sleep, where they're not going to rub up against a pillow or smother against bumper pads or have somebody who's 
you know, heavily under the influence or sleeping very heavily roll on top of them. People don't want to think these things happen, but they do happen. They happen every single week and, mm -hmm. and throughout our state. And so teaching people these things. And at the end of the class, we give them a free pack and play crib so they can take it home. And that way, they have a safe space. They can move it right next to their bed so they don't have to be away from their child. It's recommended baby sleep in the same room as parents for the first year of life. Mm -hmm. And so that gives them the option to do it safely. That's wonderful. So we're going to take a quick break and uh, be right back. Great. Yep, thank you. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, 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 go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice uh, think, think, think Tech Hawaii program. This is Beatrice Contamano. We're back with Lisa Kimura. So Lisa, we were talking about uh, two very important uh, services that seem so simple and yet it impacts the life of children and mothers in such big ways. Um, to give our viewers a perspective in terms of mortality rate or health issues related to um, you know, low infant uh, weights and, and also death uh, uh, and also in, related to SIDS. What, where are we at with our state and how are we at compared to all the states and where should we be? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, nationwide, we as an industrialized country are, I think, 24th out of all industrial, well, out of the world in terms of infant mortality. So you would think that we'd be higher. We do spend the most per capita on, on health care than any other nation. However, the rates are not indicative of what, we, what we're spending. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of room to grow. Uh, a lot of that has to do with access to health care and making sure that moms are getting getting prenatal services as early as the first week of pregnancy mm -hmm. um, and you know making sure that there are doctors that are taking Medicaid patients and making sure that we have our Medicaid program still intact those are critically important mm -hmm. um, and we, with things the way they are <laughs> it's very very important um, that we protect the services that we have because when moms and babies are born babies are born healthy and moms are healthy that's the absolute you know, cornerstone of a healthy society. Mm -hmm. And we have to do what we can to protect that. Absolutely. So I know that with that in mind, I mean, I think advocacy and the work with a legislature, not only at state level, but at federal level, to ensure that these services not only are maintained intact, but um, also encouraged to be improved, you know, it's very crucial. So what could you tell our viewers that would help them become more active players uh, in this process right now with the healthcare reform that we are about to go under, you know, and also uh, with Planned Parenthood, which a lot of people don't realize is really the only uh, uh, place that women and men uh, may access for reproduct reproductive care yes. uh, help. Yes. And also many ways in which a mother may find out that she's pregnant yes. and decide that, uh, okay, um, I need further services for prenatal care. Mm -hmm. that, that may be, you know, very well um, on the jeopardy, you know. As Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Planned Parenthood is a huge, I mean, hand-in-hand -hand partner with us because a lot of our mission is aligned. Um, we all care about making sure that all the whole family has you know access especially for screenings and for contraception access um, going in for even just regular well woman visits all of those things are services that they provide that people don't tend to think about um, and they're one of the you know really critical partners that we often refer to because they have a sliding fee scale so for those that don't have insurance 
there's still an option for them. They can take mm -hmm. care of them. Mm -hmm. um, people need to be vocal about protecting them, and they need to be protect vocal about protecting the insurance and the Affordable Care Act and the mm -hmm. services that we currently have available um, within our state and within the country. Um, there are huge disparities between the uh, infant mortality rates. For example, the state of Texas has the highest rate of maternal mortality in the industrialized world. So it is more dangerous for a woman to be born there because of a lot of factors. Uh, more dangerous for a woman to, to give birth there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just not, it's not fair for one thing, but it's not right. Mm -hmm. And we have incredible advocates working in that state, but we need to be vocal even in our state and not to get you know, complacent about the incredible amount of access and the incredible amount of progressive thoughts that we have here, we have to hang on to that and we have to talk about why it's important. Right. So on that note, I know that this year um, Family Pay Leave Act um, laws were introduced in our state legislature in what happened? <laughs> yeah, so we've had, um, well, paid family leave has been introduced for several years, and we always kind of move the needle forward. The, the issue sometimes is we, as a state, we don't have um, paid sick leave options for families either. Um, so people who are working sometimes, you know, low-wage jobs or, or um, other service industry-oriented jobs, they don't even have access to paid sick leave. So that's huge. Um, minimum wage is an issue too because we need families to be financially self-sustainable and when they're not, everybody suffers. And those issues, again, don't necessarily seem related, but they absolutely are. And paid family leave um, is an issue that's important to us because when, not only when a mom gives birth, but also if you have a spouse that gets ill, a parent that's ill, your own self and you need someone to take care of you. If you're taking time out of the workforce to be able to care for a family member or care for a brand new baby and you have to choose between your family obligations and your job, that's not a choice anybody should have to make. Mm -hmm. And so by giving people the ability to care give, which is a critical necessity, and also not making them uh, financially unsustainable during that time, it's a way to bridge and make sure, again, we have a healthy society and we have a, a, a continuum of care for all mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, so this year with the paid family leave efforts we've had, um, we are one of the founding members of the Hawaii Paid Family Leave Coalition, and our organization has been working on doing focus groups with small and large businesses, unions, parents, and other caregivers to ask them what a model paid family leave insurance program would look like, how many weeks we should take off, what percentage of our wages should be replaced, who should pay for it, how much it should cost. Um, and the, uh, we've been doing some financial actuarial studies also to look at what our existing insurance structures look like and what our um, existing FMLA and Hawaii paid family leave, or I'm sorry, Hawaii, Hawaii family leave laws look like. And so we can marry it all together and have a program that's financially tenable, financially sustainable, and serves 100% of Hawaii employees. Oh, that's wonderful. So with that uh, in the pipeline right now, so what is the plan for the fall? And what is your hope for 2018 legislative session? What are you hoping? Yeah, you know, as far as paid family leave, if we could accomplish it in 2018, that would actually be our gold standard. Mm -hmm. um, and with the very temporary um, or preliminary, pre preliminary uh, numbers that we have, mm -hmm. it's about $2 per paycheck that it would cost if we had 100% of employees paying into a system like this. And it would work the same way that a lot of insurance programs do. You pay in, and when you need it, you collect. Um, mm -hmm. And that would give people, right now you get, if you work for a company that's covered by FMLA, uh, you get 12 weeks of unpaid leave mm -hmm. entitled to you. Um, you would still get those same 12 weeks, but rather than having no income during that time, you would have some sort of wage replacement. Mm. So wait a minute. I heard uh, the magic number, $2 per paycheck. Yes. Could actually fund uh, uh, family paid family leave for the entire 12 weeks. Yes, and that would for be the entire a, state of Hawaii. Right, at a at a, a percentage of your wages. Yes, yes. Two dollars. That's nothing. I so know. So we're talking. I 
five dollars a month. Yeah, or, or yeah, oh, or depending on or your depending, pay. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. not, or four, mm -hmm. it's paid bi weekly. Right, right, right. Come mm -hmm. on, people. Yeah, it's <laughs> this really is doable. Mm -hmm. It's doable. Every, literally every other country in the world is already yes. doing it. Um, and so there's really no reason why we shouldn't. And it's not just about women, it's not just about moms and babies, no. it's about everybody and taking care of everyone in the family because everyone will need caregiving at some point in their life. It's about being allowed to be a human being yes. and to have equity and health. Because yes. I imagine it costs more to a society. If, you, if you're looking from just a pragmatic number perspective, you know, to have somebody leaving the workforce to be able to take care of themselves or their children uh, versus having that support, they'll probably come back much sooner. Yes. Prevention also is a big thing because like, if you're starting to realize that you're sick and you take care of yourself right away, most likely yes, you're exactly. going to get healthier sooner too, as opposed to getting it so chronic that it might take you twice as long. Right, right. To be able to be the back. same as anything, when you yeah. put off because of, you know, you go when it's an absolute emergency rather than keep taking care of yourself the whole way, it becomes a more expensive problem, a more complicated problem, it takes a longer recovery. Um, but the state of California has had paid family leave for over a decade now, and they have done a <laughs> tons of studies on, on the impact. The thing that they find is workers are more likely to return to work, so we have lower turnover, retention is higher, loyalty is higher, people come back rested, relaxed, and ready to work, rather than we have about one quarter of moms returning to work within two weeks of giving birth. To me, that's absolutely unacceptable. I mean, f mentally, physically, and uh, the mom herself, it's just not right. But to leave a very vulnerable infant, you know, in the care of somebody else at an extremely vulnerable time, it's, that's not the kind of society we should be. Right. And plus, you know, it's not good for the baby. No. Uh, it's not good for our communities. Uh, it doesn't make any sense fiscally, morally, ethically. Right. And it doesn't uh, go hand in hand with what the state of Aloha spirit is all about. Right. Right. In, right. That's not Ohana. No, it's not. <laughs> so how can our viewers really tag along uh, with healthy mothers, healthy babies uh, in this upcoming year or years to support uh, uh, the effort of finally breaking ground so that we can be a state that can have paid family leave? Absolutely. You know, I would say the first thing is we are very active in, in recruiting people to share their stories, share their own testimonial about what they went through. And if they had paid leave, how it helped them. And if they didn't, how it would have helped them. Mm -hmm. All of those stories really add up. I mean, we hear things like a mom who had a preterm delivery, her baby was in the NICU for over a month, and by the time her baby was released from the hospital, she had to go back to work. And she has a very medically fragile infant that needs to be taken care of around the clock. Who's going to do that? And for a single parent, that is not a choice you should have to make. So these kinds of stories that just tug at your heart and make you realize this is a human issue, those are the stories we want to hear from people. And we want people to get up and talk about it and, and share with us. Right. So I would say, first of all, just visiting our website and following us on social media, we're always posting things about ways that people can get involved. They can get on our email list for the coalition and they can find out what the activities are that we're doing, when to show up, when to share their voice, when to sh you know talk to others about it um, and, and things like our focus groups and stuff we just want to hear from people about what we can do to build the best possible program and we have a lot of other existing structures to work from so we're not starting from scratch but we want to make sure it works for the people of Hawaii mm -hmm. that's absolutely so crucial and I'm so grateful that we have Healthy Mothers and Healthy Babies Coalition of Hawaii and so many other partners you know that working together to make sure that that happens and that we have uh, opportunities you know where people can be involved as well because it really is an interdependent and interconnected process it can't happen you know just with the organizations it has to have the support of the businesses it has to have the support of our legislators uh, representatives and people just like you and I, you know, to be right. able to make that happen. Right. I can't believe how quickly our program came to an end. <laughs> I hope that this is the first of many visits that you make to us. Thank you. I and, hope so too. <laughs> and that uh, we check in and see how we're doing, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And also, I would like to extend uh, an invitation to you. 
uh, and to other community partners to also be able to look at what's happening with child maternal health, uh, not only in the state of Hawaii, but in other nations too, uh, because I think we can learn a lot uh, and uh, we can also get a lot of encouragement of how far we've come. You know, it's not only about the things that are not working, it's also looking at how far we've gotten and, you know, looking at other models, you know, that we want to mirror ourselves. Absolutely. After, yeah. Absolutely. It's about seeing what works and how to replicate that. Excellently, yes. Yeah. On that note, uh, this concludes uh, our Perspective on Global Justice program today. And uh, just remember, you know, the way we measure the success of a society is by the way we treat our children, our families, our elderly, our disabled, our people in general. So basic needs need to be covered and uh, the sanctity of us you know, as people, as humans, also is something that we need to pay close attention to. And the state of Hawaii is a perfect state uh, to emulate that, not only you know, uh, right here at home, uh, but to help uh, all the states to look at what we're doing right and uh, tag along as well. So until next Friday, uh, we hope 